Hi everyone, I'm Nicola Russell. Welcome to my channel. This is a compilation video of Very Dead Woman. These were all TikTok videos that were too long to turn into shorts, so I thought I'd make this video. Hope you enjoy. I guarantee you don't know Cinderella as well as you think you do. For example, her origin stories are Chinese and Egyptian. In the Egyptian tale, she's a mistreated but hardworking slave who's rewarded for her hard work with golden shoes. The god Horus, as a falcon, steals a shoe and brings it to the pharaoh who searches for the owner and finds the beautiful Rhodopis and marries her. Her name means rosy cheeks, which would have been an unflattering name to mock the sunburn she'd get on her pale cheeks as she was Greek stolen by pirates and sold into Egypt. Anyone without dark hair or dark eyes at the time could be a slave. In the Chinese tale, Cinderella is Ye Shin. She has a magical fish which her cruel stepmother steals and cooks. Ye Shin saves the bones and makes wishes upon them. Thanks to the bones, she's able to go to the festival and in golden slippers. She loses one there and when the emperor finds it, he searches for her and they marry. Her evil stepmother and sister live in a cave until they are crushed by falling rocks. There are over 1,500 versions of the persecuted heroine slash Cinderella tale, as mostly every culture eventually adopted their own. The version we know and love today, adopted by Disney in 1950, was written by a Frenchman, Charles Perrault. Here we have slippers of glass for the first time, but what we should really note about his Cinderella is that Cindron, meaning little ashes, is a quite passive, docile, far too nice character. Whereas the typical Cinderella is a formidable, capable, and badass young woman. Why are the best ones always murdered by Christian monks? This is Hypatia of Alexandria, a philosopher, teacher, and mathematician from 350 CE, and there's a lot of controversy and false information that surrounds her. This is greatly due to the male historians who ridiculously romanticized her and made much of her importance based on her extraordinary beauty. But the truth is, we don't actually know what she looked like. The closest source we have was born half a century after her death, but he claimed that she was so beautiful her students were frequently falling in love with her. Supposedly, one was so enamored she couldn't get rid of him until she pulled her bloody menstrual rag out and waved it in his face. It's entirely plausible that she really was this beautiful, but it's just as possible that her reputation for beauty is simply a male fantasy. The one thing we do know for certain was that she was a deeply beloved teacher and an adored figure of the city. Unfortunately, this threatened the city's bishop, and she was brutally torn apart by a gang of his monks with roof tiles. I am not a big believer in God, but Joan of Arc's story almost makes me question that. It begins when she's a child. Three saints appear to her in a vision, and they're like, don't freak out, be good, and go to church, we'll be back later. And she's like, okay, I guess. Fast forward, and she's 16, and been having these visions for a while. The Hundred Years' War between France and England has been going on a long time, and she's about to turn the tides. The saints give her the mission not only to stop the siege at Orléans, but to get Charles VII crowned as the King of France. Now, Charles was the third and only surviving son to the king, after the queen finished her royal duties by producing an heir and a spare, she went full party mode, and Charles was a bit insecure on whether he was in fact the king's son. So imagine this little country maiden rolling up and proclaiming that you're the rightful king of France as decreed by God. He was all for it. They have her exercised to make sure the visions weren't really the devil, and they somehow have her virginity checked because of course that's the most important thing. But she's good to go, and Charles gives her a horse and some armor. She tells them to go dig in a certain place, and they find a sword with five crosses engraved in it, and she was ready for war. A call for volunteer soldiers goes out, and thousands of men show up to fight for her. Her story was filling the people of France with hope. They get to Orient, and it's a brutal battle. She even gets an arrow to the neck, but her presence there incredibly inspires her men, and she wins back the city after only 10 days. Next, she gets Charles crowned, and then heads to Paris to keep fighting, where she's captured. Now, the English can't just kill her, because she'll be made into a martyr for the French. They need to figure out a way to end her righteously. A trial begins, and she's interrogated ruthlessly. They claim that she's a heretic for wearing men's clothing, so she promises to never do so again. But in her cell, her guards rip off her dress and throw men's clothing to the floor. She's given the choice to put them on or be assaulted, so she puts on the clothes. The English charge her with relapsed heresy and burn her the next day. Oh my god. Do you know what, guys? Do you know what? Y'all keep me honest, and I am thankful. So keep it coming. Also, I've made stickers, not 
with her false blonde hair but with her lovely natural and true dark brown locks the link is in my bio let me know if you want stickers of anything else pocahontas was 11 when she met john smith he'd arrived to help establish the jamestown colony built right on pocahontas's father's land chief of the powhatan people at first the chief remained unaggressive and traded with them and he soon realized that these trespassers were not very smart they'd built their fort in a poor location they couldn't seem to grow or even gather food at all their guns were impressive but slow and not a match at all to an archer. So he sent several delegations to the idiots, I mean brave explorers, and provided them with food. Pocahontas was part of these groups, and as she had not yet reached puberty and was thus still a child, she was always naked. Anyway, winter hit and no delegation had come with food for the white guys, so John Smith was sent to find Chief Powhatan. He was captured, and a great feast was held in the longhouse. For dessert, John's head was shoved on a stone and a club was raised to beat in his skull when suddenly Pocahontas threw herself between him and the execution or pleading for his life. Anyway, that's the version John told years later. The story he told in a letter sent right afterwards was that he was treated well, fed, talked with, and then let go. During their meeting, John told the chief that their ship had broken down and that they were only there waiting for rescue. So the chief agreed to continue to supply them, yet when the next ship came, it instead brought more weapons and more settlers. Rightfully pissed, the Powhatans stopped sending food and cut off communication with them. Jamestown began to starve. The colonists who had come were quote-unquote gentlemen and refused to do farm work. Eventually, they ate all their farm animals, then their pets, then the rats, and then yes, they resorted to cannibalism. But more settlers came in the spring and they rebuilt. As for Pocahontas, they captured her in the hopes that her father might feed them again. She was assaulted and then given to a Puritan pastor who Englishfied her, and ultimately she became a Christian baptized as Rebecca. She married a white guy named John Rolfe, and they had a son. Their union was credited for a time of peace between the natives and colonizers called the Peace of Pocahontas. She went to England, met the queen, died of tuberculosis, and was buried there. Pocahontas was 11 when she met John Smith, so let's draw her that way. Starting with the shape and size of her nose, it's going to be a little bit wider and a little bit shorter. Then we are going to bring up her lips as well as make them a little bit less full. Next, we'll need to completely rework the facial bone structure, so say goodbye to those Kardashian cheekbones and Timothy Charlemagne jawline. We are going to get rid of those long eyelashes and then redraw the eyes with slightly softer angles. I I am going to go ahead and erase all that woman and put in the boxy shapeless form of a girl. Pocahontas, Aminut, or Matoka, all names that are true to her, was a Powhatan child and would have constantly been naked until puberty, so I drew her in that way. Technically, she would have also been bald. Not a single woman burned during the Salem witch trials. That was only a European practice. When local folklore of flying women succumbed to the devil who kissed his buttocks, evil doers and causers of plague who gather at Sabbath to eat children and copulate with demons, met with a new text, the hammer of witches in the 14th century, fire was set to the witch hysteria. The texts serve as an encyclopedia and operational guide on how to deal with the supernatural threat of witches. Not only was it the most used witch hunting guidebook, but also supplied lovely support as to why women are more likely to succumb to the devil. Women are more carnal than a man, and all witchcraft comes from carnal lust, which in a woman is insatiable. Women are inherently weaker, and by God left in subservience to man, so it is envy which drives woman in her weakness to the evil power of witchcraft. 40 to 50,000 people were tortured and executed in Europe for witchcraft. 20% were male, hundreds were children, but most commonly they were widowed, poor, or outspoken women. When the Puritans left Europe to settle in the New World, they would bring their fear and hatred of witches with them to the village of Salem. To understand the Salem witch trials, one must understand the psychology of the villagers. The Puritans who settled there were of the business of purifying the politically and spiritually corrupt Church of England who they'd left behind. Puritans were hardy, strict, superstitious, and ran on spiritual fear. They believed each person was predestined for heaven or hell by God and spent every waking second trying to determine which way their soul was headed. The pressure to be perfect was heavy. Bad feelings like anger or envy implied spiritual weakness and could be a sign from God you were not a chosen one. Moreover, communities had a collective soul and one weak individual could mean damnation for the rest. Witches provided an out. You could blame a witch for bad feelings and kill them for the sake of the community. They provided relief in a terribly unhappy and suppressed time of life. 
Unmarried, poor, or otherwise troublesome women were typically those accused, while the accusers were those with motivation to deflect blame or attract attention. Middle-aged women facing loss of status at the end of their childbearing years, men under the pressure of providing for themselves in a family, and teenage girls who endured a completely powerless place in society could find relief for their anxieties and frustrations in accusing a neighbor of witchcraft. The tragic events of 1692 were ready to unfold. Marie Antoinette was not the villain you think she was. When she came to France, she was 14. She was a soft and shy child, come alone to the French court, who immediately began to use and manipulate her in any way they could. So she began to avoid the court as much as possible, which unfortunately offended many. Vicious rumors began to fly about her, such as she was sleeping with her husband's brothers, gambling and spending wildly, and there was even a story of an incident with Thomas Jefferson. When a bad year for grain passed, rumors were created that it was her fault for the lack of bread. Her darling husband was not exactly an ally and for the most part was also just a shy child. When he became king, he was a rather weak one. Louis the Sixteenth became a puppet to his advisors, who were having a terribly good laugh at England at the time by having Louis finance a little revolution taking place overseas. But it was Marie, of course, who was blamed for the increase in taxes. They would not laugh long, however. Taking inspiration from the newly united states, the French Revolution followed. Marie would be victim of it. After Versailles was stormed, the royal family was taken to Paris and held as prisoners. In prison, Marie had to listen to the torture of her son in the next room as he was coerced into saying that his mother had been indecent with him. It took months and he cried and cried. Finally, she was brought before the guillotine. Her last words when she stepped on the executioner's foot were, Pardon me, monsieur, I did not do it on purpose. The method of execution before the guillotine made its debut was an axeman, and it would often take more than one or two very painful swings to execute a person. So the shiny new toy, capable of slicing a head instantaneously clean off, was quite a mercy, which was exactly what it was created to be. Dr. Guillotine did not invent the guillotine, but he was a huge advocate for this new humane invention of executing prisoners. However, when the French Revolution came around, this invention was recognized not only as a successfully more humane death, but a very efficient one. During the revolution, it became so refined, it could take care of 12 people every 13 minutes. The streets running red with blood is not an exaggeration. The revolution claimed countless more deaths than otherwise would have been possible, many of which without trial. Dr. Guillotine would always regret that his campaigning for such an easy execution method led to so much extra bloodshed in the mad hands of the mob. The most powerful pirate in all of history was a woman named Jung Shi. The first documentation we have of her was when she was 20 and working as a prostitute on an illegal floating brothel called a flower boat. Men would be entertained by music, food, and the horizontal arts. Legend has it when a terrible pirate captured her boat and brought all the women onto his deck, their hands bound, he was taken aback by her beauty and had her ties cut. She sprung at him, trying to gouge out his eyes, and he fell madly in love with her. The more boring story is that he'd been a longtime customer and they eventually fell in love. But at 26, they married. Their contract stated she would share in his business in an equal amount of power and profits. They became partners and together built a pirate empire. Plus, her husband got to keep his boyfriend on the side, who'd been captured at 15 and eventually became their lieutenant. When her husband died, Jung Shi assumed full power. The only person who might have been able to contest her was the boyfriend lieutenant, who they had adopted to secure a lineage. She fixed the problem by making him her lover, which is kind of weird, but eventually they did dissolve their parent-son relationship legally and were officially married. After taking over, she installed a few new rules. If you gave command that she did not approve, if you disobeyed her orders, if you committed sexual assault, if you had sex without permission, if you were unfaithful to your wife, your head would be chopped off. Her rule was absolute and punishment was swiftly executed. As she grew in fame and wealth, more pirates came to join her forces. The number of men under her control reached past 70,000, making her... Okay, some people were way too mad that a woman was the most powerful pirate in history and they were going on and on about Blackbeard. So I just wanted to make a little list that is easily Googled. First, I do want to say Blackbeard, super interesting dude, but he's a little more legend than man. Among other terrible true things that he did, he would randomly shoot his crew. He had 14 different wives that he would let his crew assault in as he watched. Uh, he was a little bit worse of a person than your average pirate. Nevertheless, onto the list. Number one in our heart, but last on our list, we have Captain Jack Sparrow with one ship and only ever about 50 men. 
Next on our list, we have Blackbeard with only four ships and only ever about 400 men. Next, we have Captain Morgan with 36 ships and about 1,900 men. Before we get to the top of our list, I have an honorable mention to Geelong, who is more of a military leader than an actual pirate, but 400 ships and 50 to 60,000 men. Pretty good. And at the top of our list, in the height of her power, we have Zhang Xi at 1,800 ships and 70 to 80,000 men. She's the most powerful.